Well, guys, I will kick off the conversation here, and there's just a lot to discuss. So yeah. if you're in the audience and you're tuning in, you're likely someone who has a sense of the underlying power behind blockchains. At their core, these things are social coordination tools. There's a famous book called Sapiens. I'm sure you guys have read it, where the author Yuval Harari posits that what separates human beings from other species is their ability to organize in large numbers. To me, that's just so cool to think about. Like this question around how blockchains will impact organizational behavior in the next 10, 100, 1,000 years. Now, there's a key topic at the center of all this. That topic is sovereignty. My sense is that the look, feel, and meaning of what it means to be sovereign is about to completely change. And I want to talk about this change. The two projects that I believe take the idea of sovereignty the most seriously are Cosmos and Celestia. And I also believe that our two guests here, Ethan and Mustafa, are two of the world's most foremost thinkers on this subject. Before we get into the conversation, a few things for the audience. There's two important reads you should note. The first is written by Ethan, where in May he titled it The Mind, Body, and Soul of Cosmos. We'll get into that. And then the second, Mustafa recently just published this. Uh, it's a blog post titled Roll-Ups of Sovereign Chains. Uh, that's why he went out to Biddle. I talked about it there. The recording will be out later in the next few weeks. Um, I'll structure this Twitter space uh, for about an hour. We'll just dialogue and talk about it. But there will be a Q&A. So please write down any questions that you want to ask. We'll, we'll go around and, and you ha you'll have an opportunity to ask these guys uh, some important cues. Now, I'll turn to Ethan and Mustafa. This conversation, it's taking place at such an interesting time. The U.S. sanctioned tornado cash, sparking a debate on whether the ban compromises users' ability to operate anonymously. Bology has published a network state, this idea of a highly aligned online community with a capacity for collective action. Modular blockchains are the new category, attracting the boldest and most creative developers who are building on an entirely different set of values compared to monolithic counterparts. We're going to begin with the evolution of computing. Ismail DM'd me this video of a presentation that Ethan was giving at Hack Adam. And he was talking about the evolution of computing and he led up to this idea of the community computer. Ethan, we'll start off with you. Can you introduce this idea of community computing and why did you call it a revolution? Cool, uh, sure, yeah. I mean, th thanks a lot for, for the intro. I don't know if I'm actually a foremost thinker on sovereignty, though I appreciate you saying that. It turns out the more I, the more I study the problem, the less uh, it turns out I think I know about it, but we can, that's, a, I guess, a, a later conversation. The community computer idea, I mean, um, you know, I, I reason a lot by history with, uh, by analogy with history, and, you know, history doesn't compete, but it does rhyme. Um, and so I think it's important to understand history and understand where we're, where we're coming from. And, you know, it, it, it has always struck me that blockchains have a place in the history of computing. They're not some like thing that, you know, came out of nowhere, even though, you know, people like to think about Satoshi like that. But, you know, in the in the same way that, you know, Christ was Jewish, Satoshi uh, also had a, a past um, in cryptography and in, in computing and, and so on. And so the way the way I reason about it, um, you know, and, and the, the, the talk I gave recently that, that you were referencing, I think Ishmael asked for those slides, so hopefully he's going out and uh, pushing the community computer narrative too. But the, the, the framing I was using was that, you know, sometime in the 20th century, we discovered a new substrate for computing. That's the silicon microchip. And, and then the first thing we did with that was basically build these large mainframe computers, um, you know, to, to handle the world's computing needs. I mean, that was, that was what they were for. And you know, everyone was going to have these computers in these, in these, you know, basements of IBM or Dell or, or wherever. And that would be that. And, and people who thought, oh, computers could be smaller or more people could have computers or, you know, they could be more widespread or they didn't all need to be in IBM's basement. Like those people were ridiculed. And, uh, you know, it was thought that that didn't make any sense. They wouldn't have the security. They would, you know, it wouldn't, uh, it, it just wouldn't work. Right. And of course the, the, mainframe isn't the type of computing that most of us are familiar with today. Um, we had something that we call the personal computer revolution that transformed the relationship between the individual and, and technology, primarily by making the individual uh, sovereign over their interactions, their interface, um, their ownership of, of the technology they use. And, and these personal computers completely, you know, have transformed civilization over the last you know, couple decades. Now we all have multiple of them. 
we have them in our pockets. I guess all of us here are on uh, little baby ones, um, you know, mobile devices. And so the, you know, these personal computing devices really, really made a big, uh, a, a big difference in our lives. And, but it wasn't just about the personal computer. It was also about the technology that connected the different personal computers together. That's the, the internet essentially. Right. And so, you know, reasoning by analogy, I see a very similar thing playing out in the world uh, of blockchains, the new substrate for computing that we've developed that's say our equivalent of the microprocessor is the consensus algorithm in some sense. It's, it's the you know, blockchain uh, consensus computing machinery, we could say. And the first thing we did with that new technology was we went out and built mainframes and we called them things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and other you know, global scale L1 world computing type um, type networks that are, you know, that, that posit themselves as being able to support all the world's computing needs. And in the same way that the mainframes of the past didn't actually serve us the way, you know, people might have thought the mainframes of blockchains today, um, you know, probably also won't, won't serve us in the way in the way people thought. And what we need is the equivalent of the personal computing revolution. But whereas the you know, microprocessor is like a singular thing that anyone can hold in their hand and, and thereby, you know, have a, a personal computer built out of it, the consensus processor uh, is, is not such an isolatable thing. It's something that only comes together out of a, out of a group of people or, or a community and thus gives rise you know, to what we're calling the community computer, right? And so you know, reasoning by analogy, the community computing revolution that, that stands before us on which, we are, you know, which we're on the precipice of, let's say, uh, stands to transform the relationship between communities and technology in the same way personal computers did between individuals and technology by giving c- communities more sovereignty, ownership, control over their technology uh, and, and over the way that they interface with it. And so, you know, that's, that's the future we're, we're building towards, giving every community, no matter how it's defined, whether it's the community of the entire globe or the community, you know, that comes together for a particular, you know, series of Twitter spaces, whatever it might be, um, sovereignty over their, over their computing machinery. And that's what we call uh, community computers, that it's a, you know, it's a shared community hosted uh, a device that represents the values of those communities and, and sort of gives them ownership over it. Mustafa, over to you. In the context of all this change, this community computing revolution, what will it mean to be sovereign? How do you think about that and the, the evolution of that word? Yeah, so the way I think about it is that sovereignty enables consenting groups of people or communities to enter into shared economic or contractual relationships with each other without the need for some third party or some institution to enforce the terms of those relationships. Now, if you think about it, you know, throughout human history, society has been pushed forward by kind of groups of people with shared goals that have assembled, you know, whether it's the pursuit of, through the pursuit of uh, grassroots activism or struggle or some shared innovation or, or culture, uh, society has been pushed forward by that, uh, and as you said, is this what is what differentiates you know people and um, from other species? Uh, the ability to kind of assemble in large groups, and um, you know even this 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 freedom to peaceful assembly and association is you know it's a human right. It's Article Twenty of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But in order to fully realize that right of you know freedom of assembly and association. Uh, you know, groups of people need to be able to kind of create and enforce social agreements and contracts with each other that codify and enforce the rules of those relationships within the community. And that's exactly what a community computer does. You know, you have, a, you have consensus um, over, over transactions uh, and the validity of those tr- transactions are determined by some pre- predetermined set of rules that the community has agreed to agree to in a, in a sovereign way and that allows communities to kind of have relationship uh, relationships with each other whether it's an economic relationship or a social relationship without needing to rely on third parties like untrustworthy institutions or governments or corporations ethan do you see it the same way or do you have a different take yeah i think i i i see it quite similarly i mean i see there's there's an element of sovereignty that is about um, continuity uh, and you know about about being able to like constitute yourself and, and continue despite 
you know, changes. I mean, think, thinking about a sovereign individual is a little, a little bit different, but as a community, the ability for the community to define what it is and for that definition to persist uh, over time, despite, you know, internal changes by virtue of some aspect of, of the community that is, um, that is stable. And, and in this case, it could be, you know, the stable set of rules that define transaction execution, validation, et cetera, that, that Mustafa was just um, referring to. But, you know, it, it, it's also about the community being able to control that and change that over time. You know, I've seen uh, a lot of the, the Celestia writing these days are talking about how fundamentally blockchains are, are about uh, are about social consensus. At, right. And about the sovereignty of the society, essentially, um, that is deciding on the rules that then decide on how they interact together. Right. Um, and that's 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 really the, the key to sovereignty that, that you have that kind of. Uh, control and determination over over your destiny as a group, rather than uh, it being imposed on you from uh, from outside. Mustafa has this saying: groups of people with shared goals have an inalienable right to self organize, unburdened by the status quo. And I want to go deeper on this, like status quo and like the current reality. I think for Bitcoin, the original evil. Uh, were banks. And that was the, the nucleus of, of the energy that was antagonist. And is that, this, is that still the, the evil of today? Do you, and you know, the question to, to both of you guys is, what do you see as the, the most prominent evil um, against that, that dominates the status quo? I'll start with Ethan on this one first. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, the banks are still evil. <laughs> that hasn't changed. Uh, that's still important, but I think I think we can go deeper. Um, you know, to to frame it really simply, I'd think about the three factors of production: land, labor, and capital, or money, if you will. Um, and I look at the institutions we have around those those three factors, and and there's evil throughout all of them. And in, in some sense, they all need to be reformed. Um, and and maybe at least the way you know I've sort of thought about it is. You know, we could start with money and work our way down through labor into land. Um, but the way, you know, the way we've structured civil, you know, society around all, all three of those things, the institutions we use to um, to manage these, these you know, what we could call fictitious commodities. None of these things are actually commodities, but we, we treat them like they are, uh, you know, and we empower certain institutions to govern them as if they were just commodities to be, you know, doled out on, on, on the market. Um, I think that is... Uh, it's a, a profoundly evil thing to do because it's a, it completely misrepresents what these things actual actually are, right? Like land is not, you know, some commodity made for sale on the market. It's like our inheritance of, you know, 15 billion years of evolution in the, in the universe and, and what we've been granted to, to live off of, you know, on this planet together and our labor. Again, that's not a commodity for sale on the market. That's our human life force. And, you know, and similarly with money, it's actually, you know, the, the networks that enable us to trade and exchange and, and, and produce and coordinate together. That's also not a commodity, but we treat it as such. And so, you know, I think even with Bitcoin, it had a still has a quite, um, let's say, immature conception of money and, and, and the potential of money, not, not to downplay its, its importance. Um, you know, I'm, I, I tend to be more bullish on, on Bitcoin than most in the sort of proof of stake world. But um, I think we do need to go. We do need to go deeper on, on on the nature of money, and also connect to these other issues in society. It's not just about the banks. So the banks are are, are a huge evil that we still need to reckon with, um, but also our institutions around labor, which is, for instance, why our company, Informal Systems, is structured as a workers' cooperative, right? And it's a, a simple way to start to rebalance the the relationship between capital and labor, and, and just re-empower labor labor within your organizations, right? Rather than being shareholder based and, and, and only representing the interests um, of capital, sort of primarily in the structure of the company, you can actually represent very directly the interests of, of the labor force that actually makes whatever you're doing possible. And then and then from there, we also need to address these problems of land. I mean, you know, in basically every case, private property on land is downstream of violence or genocide, right? And so. Uh, to kind of ignore that and and just pretend like oh yeah we can just you know inherit this this violent past uh, and now just deal with everything on the market is um, I think there's there's a deep evil there so you know I, I think we still have to start at money in the banks and kind of work our way work our way down I'm not really sure how to go at the the other problems kind of more more directly other than you know tweeting land value tax solves this uh, everywhere I can on Twitter but um, yeah I'll stop there Mustafa over to you the question is who or what is the evil now.
Looks like we lost him. I think we lost him, yeah. I just added him back. Okay. Is Safi with us? Yeah. So, did you... Did you catch the question? Uh, yeah, I think I skipped some of it because my internet was uh, connection was lost. Um, but you, are you, are you, yeah. So you go ahead. The the question is, or the context is that for Bitcoin, the original evil yeah. were banks. Who or what is the evil now? Yeah, so I would say um, this goal of sovereignty that kind of Cosmos and Celestia envision and embody. Is a more is a is a generalization of Bitcoin's goal, in the sense that um, I think like the like the you know the evil in this context um, the evil of community the, the evil versus community computing is this idea of untrustworthy institutions, you know institutions that have traditionally been slow, you know bureaucratic, untrustworthy, corrupt, or prone to censorship, and a bank. Um, is an example of an untrustworthy institution, but this kind of this vision of sovereign blockchains and community community, community computing kind of broadens that scope to other types of untrustworthy institutions, uh, not just banks. So it's kind of extending Bitcoin's Bitcoin's uh, philosophy in some to, to some extent. Ethan. You've mentioned briefly in several tweets that the last couple of years about the internet and it's captured by Web2 giants like Facebook. And then there's this term that you brought up, digital colonialism. What is that? Give us examples of that <laughs> and go just deep on, on that. Yeah, so this is, this is the real evil uh, is, is, is Facebook. I have, I have suspicions that, you know, 100 years from now, they're going to be teaching about uh, you know, history of corporations and they'll teach about Facebook the way we, you know, we talk about like the uh, Dutch East India company or any of these other like early colonialist companies. Um, and, and, and this relates to uh, this relates to, you know, the factors of production. We don't have to go into that, that whole analysis, but I think the the digital colonialism, I mean, it's such a tragedy what's happened with, with the internet because something that emerged, you know, to be, uh, you know, to enable sovereignty and to empower individuals and this new relationship with with technology has just been like completely um, transformed in, into this monster that has instead empowered a very small number of, of you know, unaccountable megacorps um, that now basically govern the internet and huge aspects of our lives. And, and, and Facebook is probably the worst among these in the sense that the whole company is designed in a way to to hijack your nervous system, um, and and to basically, for lack of a better word, enslave your nervous system to their algorithms, uh, and that's a very that's a very evil thing um, to do. And you know, Facebook is is in some sense trying to colo- you know colonializing uh, digital spaces. Uh, it's doing it a bit more literally in certain you know geographic areas where you know they're providing internet access, but the only the only thing you can access is is Facebook related. Um, Facebook related services. And so, you know, I, I see this as this, um, you know, monopolization or, or colonialization of digital space happening in a very aggressive, underhanded, uh, in, in some cases, even, you know, uh, very directly evil way that they are, are, are trying to conquer and, and build basically an empire in our, um, in our digital lands, the way that, you know, previous colonial, em- colonial empires tried to conquer um, you know, physical lands and, and enslave people physically. It's difficult to, you know, it's difficult to, to make analogies with like real human slavery because that's just the, you know, the most, the most tragic of all possible uh, uh, oppressions probably. But, you know, the, the Facebook colonialization is so insidious that we don't even really, you can't even necessarily detect it. It's happening at a different spatial temporal scale, but uh, you know, it's our people are already aware of the impact it's having on the minds of the younger generation. Uh, you know, they're they're being brought up with a, a completely different relationship with technology. It's something they're not really sovereign over. So something that you know was was initially sovereignty, their relationship with their you know the personal devices, like you know hackers in the in the '90s or whatever, has been has been morphed into this you know uh, consumption based, advertising based. Um, economy that that really makes the individual a subject of of the megacorp and so uh you know there, there's lot, lots more to say on that i haven't really been studying the problem in, in, in detail recently but it's a very scary dangerous thing that, that facebook is up to 
Um, I'm hoping Lena Khan is just going to blow them up. So that's, um, uh, what's it called? That organization in, in, in the department in FTC or something in the U S that does like antitrust and stuff. So it seems like that we're, we're on the verge of a new era of antitrust in the U S which is like one of the only seemingly good regulatory things. I think that the U S government might be up to, you know, in contrast to some of the other stuff where I'll, we'll probably talk about with tornado cash and so on. But, um, so I find it a bit weird to find myself aligned with the U S government on certain things, but um, you know, I hope to see Facebook broken up and, uh, that's like the one thing Facebook was the one thing I, w- I was afraid of, um, for a long time, the, uh, <laughs> then their impact on the world and on, on kids, especially, and, and what that'll do to the next generation's ability to, you know, to dialogue and, and discourse and, you know, maintain good relationships with one another. And I think we're already seeing the impact of that, the huge negative impact of that. So, yeah. My next question was how can we alleviate ourselves from digital colonialism I'll kick the, that question over to Mustafa, but also, if, Mustafa, if you want to build on top of what Ethan uh, just said, go for it. Yeah, so it's interesting because, you know, when the internet first came about and you know, started to kind of first gain traction you know, in the 90s, um, it was never, like, it was meant to be decentralized. Like, it was never meant to be decentralized. Like, in the 90s, there wasn't these huge social media platforms, of course, People were just interacting on these, you know, bulletin boards. There was lots of bulletin boards, um, and even in the early two thousands, uh, you know, it was like people had their own blogs. You know, there was there was all these little, little forums. Uh, communities had all of these forums. You know, but if you remember back in the day, um, it was never like this kind of like you had these massive social media, you know, corporations where. But nowadays, instead of everyone having you know their own community websites or blogs or, or forums, um, or like even with chat rooms, you had internet internet relay chats, which was like a distributed chat room system, rather than just using things like Facebook Messenger or MSN. So, and then in you know in the in, in the mid two thousands, when there was like a whole spate of there's quite a lot of you know uh, VC funding for you know Web two type stuff, you had this you had this pendulum swim pendulum swing from you know the decentralization of internet services in the 90s and early 2000s swung to a more centralized state with these massive corporations like you know Facebook and Twitter but now we're having the pendulum swing back the other way um thanks to web3 um you know with you know of course you have block yeah, of course you know blockchains can help to solve this and now you have more distributed you know social media platform uh, blogging platforms like mirror and so on and so forth so I think you know Web three is kind of like a natural reaction to um, the socialization that has occurred on, in Web two, and the pendulum is now swinging back in the other way to to more decentralization and away from digital colonialism. I want to shift topics, but before I do, Ethan, any comments on what Mustafa said? Yeah, I mean, I I, I fully agree. I would just caution us um, to not take it for granted. Because we're going to see the same type of forces in in Web three that you know are going to push for centralizing tendencies um, that we saw in the internet and in in you know both cases it's it's downstream of of perverse venture capital incentives so you know not to uh, not to poop on the on the VCs too much but you know they're culpable for a lot of the, for a lot of the issues here just from, you know, the lack of foresight, I think, in the sort of, you know, short term, I mean, it's funny, because VCs are considered like long term thinkers, like disrupting industries. But, um, you know, I don't think they've really thought through the like, larger scale social consequences of those, um, of those disruptions. And certainly web two has done a a lot of damage. Uh, And I think there's there's real risk of the same thing kind of happening, you know, there's a bit of like a decentralization theater going on. uh, and, And we need to be careful that, you know, we don't get the same kinds of monopolistic, uh, you know, winner take all kind of tendencies. And, and, and that's been a huge part of, um, of the drive behind Cosmos and, and, and the Cosmos mission and rejection of like, you know, a singular rent seeking token that everyone has to use. Otherwise, they can't access the value we're producing um, because we want to push back about that. And we want to actually empower communities on their own terms. Um, and and you know that uh, that's a, that's a strange thing to sell as an investment thesis, but you know I'm not here to make people rich. We're here to you know we're here to change the world. So yeah, Mustafa, question for you: Why do you refer to blockchains as top level social contracts? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, before blockchains, if you wanted to kind of like have a shared contract or some kind of organization among a large group of people, let's say like hundreds of th or thousands of people, the only way you could really practically do that before blockchains is to, you know, start a company or organization or some kind of foundation or association under, you know, the law of a state or a jurisdiction. You know, like, for example, if you start, you know, a company in the U.S., that's comp that's governed by corporate law and the state that you're incorporating it, com incorporating it in. And so, and then, and then if you keep going up the stack, you have to ask, okay, what gives what gives that organization authority? Like who enforces the rules in that organization? Like every organization or company, you know, has a statute, statutes which got which which govern, you know, the the rules of that company or organization. And those that company is given authority by the law. And where does the law get get its authority from? It gets authority its authority from, for example, like Parliament or Congress. And you know, where does Parliament or Congress get authority its authority from? Um, ultimately. Um, it gets authority. It's from the constitution or the people. Um, if people tomorrow, if everyone in the US or the UK or whatever country, for example, decided tomorrow that all of a sudden, um, actually, our our uh, elected officials no longer have authority, and we're not going to we're not going to follow uh, the rules that they set. There's nothing like there's nothing you can do about that. That will happen. And you know that's happened before in, in the form of revolutions, for example. Um, so in this case, like in in, in the context of a jurisdiction, uh, like p the uh, a constitution of a country or the social contract among its people are what I describe as a top level social contract. So, for example, you could say like in the context of a of a country, a top level the, the top level social contract of a specific country is that Congress has authority. Or parliament has authority to set to set laws. If no one, the like people have to agree that people like people have to agree to that. Otherwise, it doesn't have it doesn't mean anything. Like Congress just uh, creates uh, pieces of paper. Those pieces of paper have meaning because people agree it has meaning. But uh, blockchains, for the first time, allow you to uh, create decentralized, autonomous organizations or companies or, or organizations. That for the first time um, can have rules enforced without relying on uh, on, on the social contract of people in a, in a, in a nation state. Instead, uh, because these the rules on the blockchain are enforced by an international computer network and enforced by cryptography and crypto economics, uh, you can for the first time in history have um, a decentralized autonomous organization and have you know. A contract, some kind of economic or social contract with a large group of people, without having that contract needing, needing to be enforced by traditional law, and that's the, and what I mean by top, top level. And and these blockchains only have value because people agree it has value. The, the community of that blockchain has value. Um, it's the same question as like, what fork of Ethereum is the real fork? Like, what 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 actually? Which fork of Ethereum gets the ETH token ticker? Like if I fork Ethereum right now, if no one cares about my fork, then that's not the real Ethereum. That's just my fork of Ethereum. Uh, so people agree that the current uh, chain of Ethereum or the current fork of Ethereum uh, has value because people agree that the ETH token has value, or the the, the the transactions on that chain are the real transactions that have that value. And that is a that is a top level social contract. That this is that we that the, the community of Ethereum agrees this is the correct chain, and this is, this is what I mean by top level social contract. It's a social contract that does not derive its authority from any higher authority. It's a, it's a top level contract. Ethan, any thoughts or a reaction to this idea of blockchains being a top level social contract? No, I love it. Um, I, I love this idea of like you know uh, an authority with no with no higher authority um, because it, it reeks of like religious sentiment and, you know, religion and, and higher authorities have played a huge role in, in the, you know, in organizing large groups of people, this unique, uniquely human thing we're, we're talking about, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of binding agent, you know, religion, actually the, the word religion comes from the word to bind. Um, 
and and blockchains are another kind of binding agent right uh they they bind us together in these in these kind of new ways that allow allow us to collectively do things differently um and to follow our own authority and that's the that's the the sort of heart of of sovereignty right you're not uh you're not bowing to any any higher authority you're you're sovereign over yourself you're bound together under under your own terms uh and that you know the the potential power of that is just is just incredible so um yeah if i may before we get a little into the technical part of the discussion i want to get a bit personal like why does sovereignty why is it such a big deal for you guys personally? Um, if you can go a little bit deeper and, and share like why it's like a personal matter. Uh, Ethan, we'll start with you. I know when I first talked to you, like some of the, the original stories of like how you saw in high school and, and that really stuck out to me. But the question is, why is sovereignty such a big deal for you personally? What's your response, Ethan? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have like some personal story of oppression that I'm like, you know, rallying, uh, uh, rallying back from. And, and so, you know, therefore, therefore sovereignty, it's, it's a more, um, you know, I guess, intellectual or, or emotional um, resonance with with the concept, I think, on a few fronts, one, you know, uh, so let's see, there's, there's, let's say a historical, a historical front for this, a current front for this, and then an intellectual front. So I'll cover all three. So that so the historical front, it looks to me like, you know, historically, uh, humans have been sort of marching along this path of like greater representation, um, you know, which, which is another another way of saying greater greater sovereignty for, for certain groups of people. Right. So moving from the work from a world of empires towards a world of nation states was very much about, you know, groups of people being able to declare and, you know, satisfy uh, their sovereignty as you know, the nation of France or the nation of, you know, Germany, rather than being part of some like larger, um, larger empire or, or, or kingdom or, or so on. So I think there is a, a very real historical trajectory where, um, you know, at some point, the 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 larger sovereign becomes, you know, uh, fails to sufficiently represent the complexity of the underlying citizenry. And so the citizens demand some greater, you know, improved representation and more sovereignty over their own lives. That's not just coming down, coming down from on high. And I think we're on the cusp of another such, you know, transformation. The last one, you know, maybe started some 200 years ago when when the sort of current nation states were were really being formulated and the legal structures of, you know, national labor markets and, you know, corporations and all this stuff was sort of put down in the early mid like 19th century. I think we're on the cusp of something similar, except now instead of defining the nation state, I think we're talking about defining network and city states. And I think the, the city state component of it is is actually quite important because we are, you know, cities are where most people live and, and we are, you know, local biophysical human beings that need to like get food delivered to our mouths. Um, at least for now, you can't, you can't feed yourself in the metaverse yet. Um, you know, I can't tell if people are laughing at my stupid joke. So I feel a little bit awkward when I can't, when I can't hear the audience, but <laughs> I'll just, uh, <laughs> just laugh, laugh to myself and hope that, uh, hope that covers for everyone. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, um, so I think that the you know the, the city state the sort of historical trajectory I think is um, is, is really important. I see that as as a you know uh, evolution towards you know greater expression um, of sovereignty. So that's the sort of historical side. Then on, on the current side, you know, you just look around and you look at how little control people have over their over their lives, and you know how little control communities have over their lives. Like across the world, they're subject to all of these like you know unfair terms of you know pretty much dictated by large multinational corporations and, and, and governments that just plainly don't have their best interests at heart. And it just like hurts to see that everywhere. Uh, and so that, you know, I have this yearning desire to see communities be able to, to, to take more responsibility for themselves. And, and, and that means more sovereignty. And then, and then lastly, there's a, you know, there's an information theoretic or, or you could call it a thermodynamic argument. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is sort of from my background in, in, in biophysics and trying to understand what does it mean to be a sustainable system in a universe that's always running down, right? So you have the second law of thermodynamics, your coffee cup cools, you know, the, the glass breaks, like it's always, entropy is always increasing. So they say, and yet we have these like emergent, emergent systems, you know, human beings, life, organisms, ecosystems, forests that, that, that spring up and sustain themselves despite the fact that they're in this like, you know, aggressive, destructive uh, universe and, and and why is that? Why are they able to do that? And, and it has something to do with their ability to uh, represent their environment locally 
uh, and, and the signals that drive them in a, in a local way and, and sort of encode within themselves effectively information about, about their world and about what's important to them, to them essentially, right? And so I sort of take that up to a more uh, geopolitical kind of level, thinking about, you know, what does it mean for, or, or socioeconomic level, what does it mean for economies to be sustainable systems and to, you know, better represent uh, the world and, and you know, the, their social and biophysical reality internally in, in the um, in the economic structure, and that requires a greater degree of sovereignty, so that you can have more local representation of of the world. And so, I actually see, you know, you know, sovereign, greater sovereignty as a sort of key to, uh, you know, the sustainability of of the species and and the planet. Same question to Mustafa: Why is sovereignty such a personal matter? Yeah, I want to say, like, I have I have some deep personal story of oppression, either, even though. You know, I was I was born in Iraq, and I I moved to the UK before the US in, the invasion occurred. And um, when I was a teenager, you know, fifteen, sixteen, uh, I became involved with you know various hacking groups and hacktivism. And uh, you know, we hacked into various you know corporations and governmental organizations. And you know, one of one of the one of the organizations that we hacked, for example, was this US military contractor called HP Gray Federal. And you know, from from the from the emails we discovered, I we discovered that um, they had these contracts with the U.S. government to do things like, um, like uh, de- develop Astra serving software to create lots of like fake social media accounts, or, and develop malware and, and stuff like that. So I kind of like became I kind of like became aware from a very early stage of the lack of transparency and the the power. That these kind of like large monolithic institutions have, like whether it's some like large untransparent nation state or or, or corporation, there's a lot of like um, non-transparent power that happens behind behind the scenes that can affect people, uh, ordinary people in a deep way. And um, you know when, when we were doing when we were hacking all these corporations and organizations, um, you know I was just you know a teenager and. Uh, it's all public now. I was arrested for it and stuff, and you know, I was I was as a teenager. But you know, I, I, all I had, you know, I was hacking into these organizations, and all I had was you know a cheap you know, a few hundred dollar laptop. So, it, so I kind of became aware of that, and, and and the old and you know I was communicating to other hackers and and people on these these distributed online chat rooms. So then I can I kind of became uh, aware of the power of like. Gra- of, of grassroots movements or sovereign communities to be able to kind of organize against um, like large institutions in a kind of like David versus Goliath way. They can kind of uh, like transcend the bell curve of power and kind of redistribute power back to themselves. And I think um, kind of crypto and blockchain uh, very much embodies uh, similar ideals because it allows you to, it allows people to, to transact and have relationships with each other without kind of being burdened by untrustworthy institutions or, or middlemen or third parties. Shifting gears here, let's talk about Tornado Cash. Recently sanctioned by the US government due to its privacy capabilities. The question that I want to ask is, where does the need for privacy with blockchains fit in and how will it take place given this precedent? And really, I just want to get your guys' point of view on the whole situation Ethan, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a pretty dangerous situation here. Um, you know, they sanctioned a piece of code. There's a, you know, a guy's in jail for writing open source code. I guess we still don't know all the all the details of that story, but um, it doesn't look good. You know, I mean, privacy, privacy is a human right. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty fundamental fundamental thing. And, you know, there's a, there's a you know, free speech component of, of all of this that, you know, people are just... You could print this code on a T-shirt. You're going to arrest someone for making a T-shirt with, you know, some letters on it. I mean, this is we, we <laughs> our uh, our ancestors, so to speak, fought this war in the '90s. You know, the so-called um, crypto war, and they won on the surface. And you know, the state sort of went went behind everyone's back and went into you know the metadata and all this other other surveillance technology. Uh, and and it looks like we're going to have to fight this war again. But it's but you know the, the privacy technology is is absolutely critical, fundamental. Um, 
defense against just you know authoritarianism and, and and oppression and it's it's completely critical and it's it's a little bit of a shame that it's not more fundamentally built into our um to our technology stack i think you know with what's happening there's going to be greater efforts to do that it's coming there's been huge evolution obviously over the last few years in you know huge advancements in in, in zero knowledge tech and um, you know, there's much more mature libraries now and stuff. So I think we'll see it, you know, quite uh, rapidly adopted in, into things. And I think it is, um, it is pretty critical that, that it does be, it does become sort of baseline default, you know, privacy by default in, in all of these systems. Mustafa, over to you. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a shame that uh, so far, like crypto has been kind of the opposite of, of privacy. Um it's you know it's it's kind of like it's a non-private version of cash in in a sense and you know that's, that, that's something that people need to take more seriously uh, because it's definitely the case like privacy could limit sovereignty to some extent if communities don't organize in a sovereign way if um, you know for example like a state could sanction them for example. Before I move on, any other th thoughts on this, Ethan, as it relates to Tornado Cash? Any, is there a message you want to get across around this? Yeah, I mean, I think the, as far as I know, the Coin Center team is doing great work on on actually going to bat for this one um, and challenging, you know, these the the sanctions on, on the address. I don't know what they're going to be able to do about, um, you know, arresting developers for, for open source code, but we do need, we do need to push back against this. Um, I don't exactly know how I'm still sort of catching up on the, you know, the, the state of, um, of this battle, but it's, um, it's an important one. And, and, you know, this is just the first shot fired, really. I mean, this is going to be, this will be years, um, this fight. So it's not just going to be about tornado cash, but you know, it's a much bigger, um, much bigger challenge ahead. I mean, the IRS just hired what 87,000 enforcement agents. Like that's what <laughs> And it's not like we're all here trying to evade taxes or something, but you know the state's going to throw everything they've got at this thing just to just to uh, preserve their sovereignty in a sense because they know it's being challenged from from the bottom. And you know, uh, I uh, I'd like to find ways to work with the existing states and and you know gracefully deleverage them is 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 the term I use. Um, you know, so that so that we don't all have to go to war with each other physically, but. Um, yeah, it's certainly dangerous, uncertain times. And so, you know, everyone needs to be extra careful and, and cautious. But, you know, we also we also need to defend these you know basic rights. Mustafa, any final thoughts on Tornado Cash before we move on? Yeah, I mean, one, one other thing I would add is um, when people kind of learn about sovereignty and like one kind of natural criticism of it is that, well, like if... Um, anyone can kind of solve anyone can create a kind of group any kind of group can self organize then you know what if bad groups of people self organize you know how do you deal with that and i think like my my answer to that in general is um as i said like my kind of vision is groups of people should be able to self organize without being burdened by the status quo and and the the without the status quo part is important because it means that uh, if people self-organize, you can't a, one group of people can't impose their status quo over someone else. So, like for example, if you know if a a violent or you know a terrorist group self-organizes, for example, um, they should not be able to um, kind of impose their status quo over someone else because those people can also self-organize or have their own sovereign community. And so my, my general philosophy is um, the answer to oppression is not more oppression, but more liberty, li liberty and technologies, technologies that, that liberate people. Let's get a little technical. For those folks that are just learning about sovereign blockchains, Ethan, can you tell us what the essence of a sovereign blockchain is and why it matters? Sure. I mean, it's it's the community computer, right? So it's um, it has the same relationship to Ethereum as your you know laptop does to the mainframe at you know the IBM headquarters. 
Um, the crux of it is is the community that's building the application uh, has end to end responsibility for the whole stack from the whole computing machinery, right? So that means they, they, they assemble their own validator set, they run the consensus themselves, they have complete control end to end um, over over the, the infrastructure and the application, they're, and they're completely sovereign over it, and over the terms on which they decide to interface and, and interconnect with, you know, all the other uh, sovereign chains or other applications out there. So it's really just about, you know, complete control end to end of the stack and, and being able to, you know, customize it and, and use it to represent, you know, fully the values of that community without making any compromises that, you know, they don't, they don't actively want to make. Right. So it's really about, um, you know, enabling a community to express their own values to the fullest extent within both the infrastructure and application that they're running. Mustafa, what are sovereign rollups and how do they compare against sovereign L1 chains? Yeah. So um, a rollup is just a blockchain without its own value set. Um, it's basically a rollup is just a blockchain that posts its blocks to a different blockchain. And because it posts its block to a different blockchain, that, that other blockchain actually um, can uh, order its blocks. And so that other blockchain gives it consensus over its blocks. And because of, because of that, um, you, can, now you can create your own chain without any validator set, because instead of having to have a validator set to order your order the transactions, you just post the transactions or blocks to some um, data layer like the Celestia, and that data layer will automatically order those blocks. And uh, it's, so, it, it's, it's sovereign because unlike like Ethereum rollups, where Ethereum rollups are basically like uh, baby chains or L2s to Ethereum, that kind of enshrine Ethereum as a settlement layer. Like there's a smart contract on Ethereum which defines what the rollup is. A sovereign rollup is not defined by the L1. Instead, a sovereign rollup is defined by the the, the peer to peer network or the community of that of that rollup, not some smart contract on the layer one. It's just using the data layer um, as a data availability and consensus layer not as a, like an enshrined settlement layer. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to create um, like sovereign independent blockchains without the overhead of having to bootstrap your own consensus network um, or validate a set as, as you would typically do if you were to deploy a Cosmos zone. Now that does mean like the, 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 the main trade off there is um, you don't get sovereignty over the ordering of your transactions, uh, well, necessarily, uh, or blocks, depending if your rollup is a sequencer or not. But you still get full sovereignty over the actual rules of, of your rollup or community computer. And you also get um, this idea of shared security because you have um, your, your, your rollup is sharing or inheriting security from, from the Celestial data layer. Let's talk a bit about governance. So sovereign blockchains are about providing communities with autonomy to make decisions. Common forms of governance include token voting and off-chain social consensus. What are the trade-offs between them? And what are some of the other ways to set up governance around blockchains? Ethan, your thoughts. Yeah, um, well, there's so at, at the end of the day, um, you know, off-chain consensus always rules. Um, it is the, you know, like we've been saying, the sort of highest authority in some sense. Um, and, and, and it has, it has a sort of power over, over the network that you can never really encode because at the end of the day, you know, you can pull, pull cables out of the wall and humans have to have to decide things for the, for themselves. Um, there is certainly within the blockchain space, a, a drive for some form, you know, some level of government on-chain governance minimization. Um, which is, you know, positioned as a way to reduce the risk of capture, which is a very, you know, very real, very concerning thing that we see in political systems all around us, um, you know, where, where money can just basically buy votes. And that's and, 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 and that's a big concern. And that exists that exists on chain as well. So obviously, you know, Bitcoin has, and, and Ethereum have both um, resisted pretty heavily any, any kind of push to have on chain governance. They want to do it all completely off chain. Uh, which, which is, you know, very respectable and, and, and appropriate at, at certain levels. Um, you know, we've, we've taken another approach, which is 
you know, uh, going back to these, these problems of sovereignty and, and representing stakeholders in, in the state machines that, that organize them, um, of, of giving more direct, uh, say, representation within the state machine itself, so with on-chain, on-chain voting to the stakeholders. In, in the base case, that's just, you know, the coin holders and, you know, and what, and what they have staked. And, and Cosmos chains are somewhat famous in, in blockchain, um, you know, communities for having such active governance turnout and, and participation, which is, which is kind of amazing to see. So, you know, on the one hand, there are real risks of, um, you know, uh, being able to vote just based on, based on your stake. Like that's not, it doesn't necessarily make for the best form of governance, but on the other hand, uh, there's a way for, for anyone in the community to really actively, you know, express and, 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 and participate. And I think, you know, this is just sort of phase one of, of on-chain governance and there's a lot further to go in, in evolving, let's say the stakeholder representation, because there are more stakeholders in the system than just, you know, represented by, um, by I don't think staked to their, to a validator or, or whatever. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more innovation in, in representation, in in the forms of voting used, uh, in setting up the houses or things like sort of optimism is doing. Um, there's there's a lot of potential there, and obviously there's a long history of you know human societies exploring different um, governance procedures and, and and voting systems and so on. And so you know I think we're we're sort of just beginning to beginning that in in the blockchain space. Mustafa, your take? Yeah, so I'll I'll say this quote by uh, David Clark. Uh, like an early internet pioneer, uh, which says, uh, we, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. And that's something that I very much kind of buy into. And um, I think, you know, uh, on-chain governance, you know, like by on-chain voting is, is, is kind of okay from a practical perspective for some like technical parameters, you know, things like maybe like um, the block size or, or block interval. But for kind of like more major architectural changes in the blockchain, uh, it's better to defer to off-chain uh, governance. And this, we've seen this has worked relatively kind of well for Ethereum. You know, like no one is opposing the Ethereum proof of stake upgrade, for example. And that's because, you know, since Ethereum was created, you know, almost yeah, less than 10 years ago, um, it's always been part of the Ethereum roadmap that they will eventually drop proof of work and switch to proof of stake. And so that, that's kind of always been the kind of a, part of the social consensus of, of Ethereum, that it, it, it was always going to switch to proof of stake. And that's why now Ethereum is switching to proof, proof of stake without any kind of, without any significant controversy or, or pushback. And it's, it's a relatively non-controversial hard fork. One other technical question and then we'll we'll make our way in toward towards a Q and A. I got this question from John Charbonneau at Delphi. Can we compare and contrast sovereignty of a traditional L one, for example, a Cosmos zone, to that of a sovereign rollup, including practical implications due to complexities around bridging introduced by sovereign rollups? Ethan, your thoughts? Yes, I haven't I haven't thought through uh, in in too much detail all of you know the the complexities of of sovereign rollups. I think um, Mustafa touched on a few a few of the um, a few of the trade offs. Um, I think they are there. There's a lot of similarities, but you know, essentially, like what a what a sovereign chain gives you is end to end integration of all of the pieces under one roof, right? And 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 with a sovereign rollup, you are outsourcing you know, some aspects of it. In, in the case of Celestia, you could say that, you know, data availability and, and, and consensus. Um, and it may make sense to outsource that. And, and it's not, you know, I get maybe it's not clear today what the consequences of doing that might might be. It's certainly going to be a lot easier to bootstrap um, and, and, and get your thing off the ground and potentially transition if you need it to, you know, the, the let's say, end-to-end -end sovereignty of, of a chain um, you know, further, I don't, I, I don't know what, what terminology to use to distinguish, um, you know, sovereign roll up from sovereign chain, because, because I know people also like to say roll ups are just blockchains too. Um, so we have to, we have to work on our, our terminology there, but, um, maybe Mustafa has a more full answer here. Go for it, Mustafa. Yeah. I mean, um, I think that the kind of like two sets of trade-offs, the first of which, as we already said, uh, a sovereign roll up does not have 
have sovereignty over the transaction or block ordering, um, and uh, and and to yeah, you know, the, the implications of that I think for most use cases there's no implications because I think uh, for most kind of sovereign chains um, they don't need sovereignty. They, they they're not really doing anything particular with sovereignty over the consensus. Uh, they rather need sovereignty over the state machine, or uh, which is what their actual community computer is. But for, you know, for some use cases, uh, which I think is not the norm, you might want to do something special, like in in uh, in the consensus algorithm. Um, you know, for example, like Osmo Osmosis does this this threshold encryption and decryption thing on a consensus level to prevent MEV. Um, but I would say, for, like for most use cases. Uh, sovereignty over the state machine is is kind of like the full sovereignty that that, that, that they effectively need. But uh, the other trade off is um, with 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 Celestia, uh, Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on like how many validators you expect your chain to have. So the, the kind of the overall vision of Celestia is to uh, like uh, is to envision a, 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 a internet of blockchains or a cosmos with potentially millions of cosmos zones. If we have a world with millions of cosmos zones, it's just not secure for all of those zones to have their own fragmented validator set. It's like if, imagine if a smaller community wanted to create a cosmos zone, and there's just you know like three or four validators, you can't you can't really have secure IBC connections between chains because uh, because the fact that the validator set is so fragmented, if a cosmos zone has very few validators that can easily that doesn't have much economic security that can easily be taken over that doesn't give you much um, kind of economic security uh, of secure bridging. But if those chains share a, a data availability layer like Celestia, uh, then you can have shared security among those chains because you don't need to rely on this committee or validator based assumption for bridging. Instead, you just need to rely on fraud proofs or ZK proofs to prove that the chain is correct rather than assuming that a honest majority of that chain is correct, which might not be a sound assumption if that chain does not have a, a lot of economic value on it. Before I ask my final question, Ethan, any final thoughts on this subject or this topic? Yeah, I think that that's all, that's all accurate. I mean, the only, the only thing I'm starting to push for um, is reasoning more in terms of political economic security rather than just economic security, which is probably you know a blasphemous thing to say. Uh, somewhat, but I think it's um, I think it, it's important to the future that we, we think about these things not just entirely secured by by pure economics, but there is you know there is a, a greater um, sort of human and, and political element of, of the security as well. That's very difficult to reason about, no doubt. I'm not sure how we you know how we would would formalize it, but um, it's a direction I'd like to see the whole space move in a little bit, especially when we're talking about um, when we're talking about these smaller uh, smaller community computers where, where there are these, these kinds of concerns. And, 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 and it could be that, you know, it, maybe it doesn't make sense. And the best thing for them is to use um, Celestia and a, and a data availability layer. And that just sort of takes care of the problem in a kind of straightforward, kind of amazing way. Um, but I would still push for, for people to, you know, expand just from pure economic reasoning to political reasoning, because it, it's there anyway, whether, whether, whether you like it or not, the politics of each chain actually matters to reasoning about the security in a way that's not just captured by the economics. So, yeah. We are about to go into Q&A. So if you're in the audience, uh, please gather your questions. We will conclude with vision uh, for the dialogue. Um, Celestia and Cosmos, how are their visions similar? And then how are they dissimilar? Ethan, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think they're uh, extremely aligned projects. I mean, in some sense, you know, so if you think about, you know, the, the core values of Cosmos were you know, sovereignty and interoperability. And, it, you know, uh, that, that basically boils down to app chains on the one hand and like IBC on the other. And if you think about like the end game for both of the, for each of those two things, the end game for app chains is like have billions of them and make it as easy as possible to launch them. And that's basically like what Celestia is up to. And then the end game of IBC, at least one way I think about it, is like be able to run Tendermint itself over IBC, 
like IBC be so powerful and, and generic and easy to use that you could actually implement a consensus protocol using IBC as the as the transport layer, which is something no one's really working on just yet, but you know we'd, we'd like to do in the future. So um, I think uh, in some sense, Celestia is like a realization of the ultimate, um, you know, end, end, end game or of, um, of Cosmos. And, and actually, I don't, I don't know how well this is known, but one of the early iterations you know, when we were iterating on on Cosmos, we had this idea of what we were calling Super Tanker at the time, um, which is very similar to what what Celestia is now, except we didn't have data availability proofs, um, so we didn't know how to solve that piece of the puzzle, and so we moved on to you know the Cosmos hub and spoke kind of um, kind of architecture there. But uh, you know, certainly glad Celestia has come along and 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 solved that that big hole in the puzzle and is going to make app chains, you know unbelievably easy to deploy before we go to mustafa obviously it seems like a lot of similarities but any dissimilarities that uh, come to mind any dissimilarities um well i mean there's obviously a, a difference in emphasis between the um the sovereign chain and and you know the sovereign roll-up but um the projects feel so so aligned i mean celestia is built using a lot of the you know the cosmos stack and is really sort of pushing the cosmos vision you know to a new frontier um you know i think there's 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 differences in you know in, in roll-ups and, and and chains but i think we very much um you know very much acknowledge and and respect both sort of sides of that and celestia itself as a chain is sort of you know a, a, a cosmos based chain so i don't know if um you know, per se, there are differences, or if it's just like, uh, you know, we're filling in together, we're filling in the spectrum of, of possibilities that neither, you know, neither team can sort of do alone, I guess, um, is maybe the way to frame it. Mustafa, over to you finally. Similarities and dissimilarities between the visions of Cosmos and Celestia. Yeah, I think that's totally accurate. I don't really, I don't really have much to add to that. Uh, I think like the high level visions are similar. Um, yeah, I definitely see Celestia as a kind of extension uh, to fully realizing the Cosmos vision rather than uh, like a juxtaposition position to it. But as a result of extending that vision, there's um, some technical dissimilarities and that mainly revolves around um, Celestia has less of a kind of uh, reliance on trying to rely on committee-based assumptions. You know, for example, where IBC relies on uh, honest majority of value assets uh, to, to for secure bridging. At Celestia, we want to kind of try to eliminate um, as many committee based or honest majority assumptions uh, as possible for the safety of the system at minimum. All right. We are now taking questions. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we'll go from there. So our first question. Speaker. Barton, I think you're connected. Go for it. What's your hey, question? Um, I'm exploring the uses of uh, IBC in uh, critical infrastructure, specifically on smart grid uh, and coordination in energy markets. And so there, too, is very sort of a political value pl pluralistic uh, process. I was wondering, uh, as one of the choices of communities uh, to have a private permission chain, let's say under a threat model of uh, sort of adversaries attacking your energy grid. Have you seen any applications of Celestia or Cosmos to where some chains are completely private and there are chains that sort of connect the public IBC to allow for exchange of value to take place? Yeah, I think you can, I mean, you can build a, a private chain, I believe in either either case uh, on Celestia, you're just, you're just publishing the data, um, but you get the data avail availability, but maybe it, maybe it's less relevant there than, than running um, uh, a private sort of full chain. I think we've definitely seen a number of, um, of folks. I mean, we don't even know who's running them. We've, we've heard a little bit about um, private chains for these, these kinds of applications. So it's certainly, it's certainly doable. The question then oh. would, with IBC and connecting to the rest of the network is a little bit more, um, a little bit more hairy, depending on you know the assets and, and the kind of interactions you're expecting to have with the rest of the network. But you know that would you'd really have to drill in on the on the use case. But like by by private here, do you mean privacy preserving, or do you just mean like um, this essential sequencer? 
uh, permissions and possibly having sort of its own validator set uh, that's you know specific to uh, operation in the field. Sort of let's say sort of data availability happening close to renewable resources. Uh, yeah, and basically the question also like is there anything fundamental about permissionless or like uh, uh, open uh, chain for security purposes? Yeah, I mean, I, think, I guess if it's a, if it's a permission chain, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny, right? Because uh, I remember a few years ago, there was this kind of like big thing about like uh, IBM trying to do enterprise chains uh, using Hyperledger and in, like, you know, for like supply chain management and stuff like that. But in, in a lot of use cases, it's like, who are the validators? Uh, it, it doesn't, like, there's no natural choice of who the validators should be. In the chain, so it's like you end up with like three validators or something run by three different people. Uh, in those kind of use cases, like a roll up with a centralized sequencer makes more sense, uh, or a centralized set of sequencers makes more sense if you're trying to do a permission chain, uh, where there's like a, some consortium or, 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 or sequencer decides um, what gets included, but you still get the transparency and safety of a roll up. Because anyone can all can that's because because of the fact that the chain has data availability, anyone can audit it to see that the sequencer did its job correctly. Thank you for that. A priori, your turn. Hey, thank you for having me on. Um, just curious how uh, both Ethan and Mustafa think about incentivizing um, building applications that are not necessarily related to DeFi or NFTs, just as we've seen with. Um, the general public, a lot of the shelling point for interest in cryptocurrencies is this financial component uh, related to tokens. And there have been some restrictions with scalability into building uh, social applications. But uh, going forward, a lot of these scalability restrictions will be removed as bottlenecks. And so how do um, we think about incentivizing builders, creators, um, community members to start thinking about maybe social applications or other use cases for blockchains aside from just DeFi and NFT trading? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult one um, because the, there's not that many successful non-financial applications of blockchains yet. Um, like, a lot of, yeah, I mean, a lot of, um, fundamentally, like, um, a lot of applications of blockchains are economic because that's what blockchains allow you to do. It allows you to create economic relationships to people because um, it doesn't allow you to kind of like um, enforce like physical physical kind of contracts yet. But I mean, I guess like some use cases, like I don't know if you would consider like ENS, for example, a DeFi application or not, but it's still financial to some extent because like a, um, a domain name is an asset. So I could definitely see like applications of blockchains that are based on assets, but not necessarily De DeFi based. You know, like domain names are an example of that. Or you could have like reputation reputation systems. You know, there's things like uh, Gitcoin Passport, for example, and or Proof of Humanity, which are interesting systems that kind of allow you to do things like proof of personhood, uh, kind of like a alter like alter alternative identity identity systems independent of the state. I guess those aren't financial. And in more general, more generally, I, I definitely see um, blockchains being used, but for like governance, and not necessarily being financial. Like, if you have an association or or company or, or, or company or organization, you could imagine like the the board meetings or the general meetings of the organization, the decisions being voted on transparently on a verifiable ledger or or, or a roll up or a chain, for example, rather than. Uh, in an unverifiable way. Wrong. Yeah, so one oh, way. Go ahead, actually, actually, go ahead, Ethan. Go ahead. I'll just go quickly. I mean, one way I think about blockchains is the sort of natural evolution of um, fault tolerant databases from the single stakeholder to the multi stakeholder domain. So going from you know a fault tolerant database run by a single entity to a fault tolerant database run by multiple entities, and then you're asking, you know, what are the what are the use cases of that? And, and, and ultimately they could be, they could be anything. Obviously we're finding product market fit with, um, with, you know, finance. I think it, I believe that one of the, 
you know, the pinnacles of multi-stakeholder applications is money itself. And that money is actually the killer app um, of blockchains, but we haven't even begun to, to really do that. I mean, I think like the monetary economics of, of blockchain people is still like very repressed and, and, and <laughs> the development has been arrested. So I think there's, there's still a lot of work to do there, but I ultimately see it happening through um, working with cities. I mean, if, if, if we're serious about this sort of city state revolution and municipal sovereignty and things like that, I see, you know, cities adopt blockchains as sort of a major, a major phase in its adoption curve and in, in evolution and, and, and using them to do more participatory budgeting with, with the citizens and, and governance related things and, and ultimately issuing and managing their own, um, their own currencies. Um, so that's, that's kind of the direction I'm, I'm pushing, um, at least. Ron, your turn. Well, guys, thank you for having me on. I just have a quick question. I'm curious, what, what kind of communities do you believe are going to be like the low-hanging fruit for Celestia uh, that you think might be the ideal targets? Yeah, so I think um, like any kind of DAO, uh, that's not necessarily a, a DeFi protocol, um, could like naturally uh, use Celestia. So, for example, you know, there's various uh, kind of like grassroots activism DAOs on uh, Juicebox. You know, there was like you know, things like Con Constitution DAO or Assange DAO. You know, for example, like Assange DAO was a DAO to kind of raise money for Julian Assange's legal campaign that raised 50 million. Um, I think a lot of those DAOs um, could potentially be a, a better fit for Celestia. Because they kind of it embody this kind of pro grassroots kind of sovereign uh, acti activism ideals, but uh, in the long term, it's kind of like really hard to say what um, like the mass adoption case or use cases could be because because there's so many potential uh, use cases. Even like um, I also think things like gaming and NFTs are a very natural fit for application specific rollups. Specifically, solid rollups, simply because like gaming applications or, or or gaming assets or NFTs, they don't require a high frequency of compatibility with other smart contracts. Unlike DeFi, for example, um, you don't need you don't need, you don't need like a single settlement layer to you know trade NFTs, for example. Like unlike you know DeFi tokens, which have to, which have to interact with with DEXs and stuff like that. But in the long term. Um, yeah, so that, so I mentioned I just mentioned two potential use cases, but in the long term, as I said, um, there's a wide variety of use cases, and in the long term, it could be the case that just like every kind of community or organization has its own you know Slack server or Discord server, it's possible that every community or organization has its own like DAO or you know rollup chain that kind of manages the members of the organization and uh, tracks value and assets. A few more questions and we'll wrap up. Steph, your turn. Okay, I'll try to keep this quick because I have one question and then it's kind of morphed as the as the conversation. So the the well, I have a question and a statement. The what do you see as the multiple like the or the the I don't know the easiest barriers to adoption or what is the the friction? Right, because Cosmos isn't 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 new. Not that people don't use it. However, Celestia is 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 new, and the what I find a lot from the technical perspective is that there's a lot of talk about the what this unlocks, what are the possibilities, right? However, the people as the end users and Facebook was one of the things that was talked about. No one care like like they know it's bad, right? However, it's a lot easier to just sign in with Facebook, sign in with Facebook, give them all of my information. Now, do they own that? Then yeah. However, it's still happening. Even you can sign in to Twitter with Facebook, right? So, uh, what do you see from that side? And then I want to make a comment just on the colonialism and the land grab piece of it, which, uh, yeah, that's a that's a really touchy subject and probably why I don't get uh, uh, <laughs> not able to talk in a lot of tech spaces because it's just it's so uncomfortable to hear 
right? Like as the descendants of at least just slaves in America, that it is a a tough thing when we're we're talking about equating these two things as apples to apples. And it's it's really just not that, especially when we're talking about what are what are what are true evils. So that's my question in my statement. So can you uh, repeat your first question again? If I don't sound correct. Yeah, my question. Yeah. So yes, it got lost in my statement. So the question is about the friction and the barriers to entry, because a lot of the when when the tech is presented, it is these are this is what it unlocks. Right. Even the pictures are my chain. Right. You know, you can do this. It's modular blockchains, right? However, once you say you grasp that concept, then people don't really care. They're still using Facebook, right? So, I mean, from a from a purely kind of pragmatic, yeah, from from a purely kind of pragmatic perspective, you're right. The question is, why should I create my own chain? Uh, like so far, we've be, we've been kind of talking about like the political or social political reasons why you might want to do that. But like in the long term, uh, like most developers might not care about that. So I kind of like um, uh, realize that you need good, you need a good practical reason for why that's useful. And in our case, um, we believe that if we make it as easy for people to deploy their own chain as it is to deploy a smart contract, then deploying a your own chain is, will be a superior technical solution to creating. Uh, decentralized application uh, for several reasons, uh, the biggest of which is scalability. Um, when you have your own rollup, you're not sharing the same execution resources as other applications. So if you if you use Ethereum right now, um, you're sharing gas, you're sharing execution with every other application, and that's why gas fees are so high. Uh, and that's why people have to move to rollups. So you know, so so rollups helped you to scale because you're effectively sharding the you you effectively have your own um, kind of roll, your, your chain with its own execution resources. Um, and the second thing is that kind of the reason why sovereignty is interesting from, from a technical perspective is that it gives developers you know freedom over their own execution environment, and that um, fundamentally potentially allows them to create a better product. Um, both from a developer user experience perspective and a, and a scalability perspective, uh, and um, that uh, yeah, just it's just like you, people most developers these days would rather create their own virtual machine on EC2 rather than using some shared web hosting provider like DreamHost, for example, because the EC2 instance you can install whatever you want on that, and a sovereign rollup enables the same thing. So it's just it's just a superior developer experience that allows you to create a better product. Thanks. One final question. Sorry, just is, that, I, I just is that Mustafa? Is that Mustafa or not? Is that Mustafa? Yes. Go, go. Oh, sorry, Ethan. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to. I I, I didn't catch the name of the, of the previous question asking, but there there was a second part of her um of the uh, question, or there, there was a comment that I just. I just want to appreciate you sharing that because I know that that is difficult and uh, I should be more careful with the language. So, you know, thanks for, thanks for calling that out and, um, you know, I'm not going to make any, any excuses. So just, um, I just want to thank you. Okay. So we are near time here. Um, we'll go to closing statements. Ethan, thank you so much for, you know, hopping on here and just giving us your point of view. Is there any parting wisdom message Anything that you want to share before we take off? Yeah, just that this is the com community computer revolution, um, you know, and, and, and what we do with it is, is on us. And let's not make the same mistakes that we made um, with personal computers and, and the Internet, especially where we, we ceded control to these, you know, mega corps um, that now dominate our lives. And so we have a, a chance to do this again and to, you know, re-empower communities with, with technology. Um, and, and we should be very cautious about that it's very powerful stuff uh and you know with great <clears throat> with great power comes great responsibility so um i think we need to you know we, we need to be just just careful about about what we're doing and, and and deliberate and you know not just rush ahead with things that that sound fun or, or like they'll make us rich but um you know there's uh there, there's a lot at stake on in this next in this next generation of of tech and um you know that's that's very exciting but it also 
um, you know, we need to, we need to think hard about it and, um, and, and, and just be careful and, you know, not move fast and break things, but, you know, maybe move slow and fix things kind of thing. Um, yeah. So that's my message. Mustafa, your closing remarks on the topic of sovereignty. Yeah. I'll just end with the, the three values of modular blockchains, which is what we as for are building. Um, the first value is that users are first class citizens of the network because they can run like clients and these like clients or nodes, they allow them to kind of participate in the network um, and help to directly contribute and validate the network and um, have a similar level of security to full nodes. And that kind of like shifts power away from the validators to, to use back to users. A second value is um, modularism and maximalism. This idea of like these L1 wars where every it's like it's kind of like football clubs where everyone is like a fan of a specific L1, shilling their the specific L1 and saying it's better than the other one and, and being L1 maxis. Uh, that's kind of like uh, in the past. Um, modularism is better because uh, the people should just be able to f- choose what technology they want to use in their stack, and that's fine. And um, and finally, uh, modular blockchains enable sovereign blockchains for sovereign communities by making it easier for the sovereign communities to create their own chains because they, they, can just, they don't have to bootstrap their own consensus set anymore. There you have it. Ethan, thank you so much for joining. We'll see you offline. Mustafa, thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks, guys. Be well.